right. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's see. Do you hear the mic where you're sitting? No. Okay. Here. It's coming I could do that. How about now? Oh, that's much better. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Peters. Most of you know me. I'm the co-chair of the seminar committee with Aaron Hennessy as my, my other co-chair. And I have one announcement, and then I'm going to introduce today's speaker. So my announcement is that you have probably seen, because it was sent out last Wednesday, a survey on the Friedman Seminar. We have a survey that lists a bunch of topics which we have received over the past couple of years from people, and we want to know what you want to hear about. It also includes an open box if you have just general comments on topics or speakers or anything else about the seminar. So we are extending the deadline by a couple days. Please, if you haven't filled it out already, do it by this Friday, 2nd of February. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Lisa Freeman has joined us today. She's a professor at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine, which is part of Tufts, it's just down the road in Grafton. She is also, she has a secondary appointment here at the Friedman School, and she did her DVM training and her doctoral training in nutrition uh, here at Tufts University. So what she is, what she researches is, uh, nutrition and the development of the progression of heart disease and cachexia and sarcopenia in animals, but she's here today to talk about One Health. And if you've not heard of One Health, it's an interdisciplinary approach to solving challenging medical issues and to advancing the health of people, the health of animals, and the health of the planet simultaneously. I will not steal any of her thunder, so I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa for the next 45 to 50 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here today. Thanks for the invitation to come chat with all of you. Um, how's the sound in the back? Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to talk about nutrition across the species, but really what I want to get across is that we're a lot more alike than you think. Uh, we share a lot with our uh, companions animals and other animal species. So I was uh, driving in this morning and it made me think back a lot to the four years that I drove in every day and yes there was traffic as usual today, it was such fun. Uh, so I spent a lot of time coming uh, to, to the Boston campus uh, during these years. I continue to come here being uh, on the faculty here um, and involved in a lot of other areas in the Boston, on the Boston campus. But my home base now is much more idyllic. So this is where I work mostly now. This is, um, as Chris said, on the Grafton campus. So that's about an hour due west of here without traffic. Um, and it's really a beautiful campus out there. How many people have been to Grafton before? A few of you. OK, excellent. Well, if you haven't come, we'll have to arrange a field trip because it's really beautiful out there. Um, this will give you a little bit of a feel of what we do out at the veterinary school. We actually have seven separate hospitals at Cummings. Um, so we have our main hospitals, which is the small animal hospital and the large animal hospital. We also have a spay and neuter clinic. Um, we have a large wildlife clinic. We have an ambulatory uh, field services that's down in Woodstock, Connecticut that uh, works with farm animals, uh, cattle, horses, sheep. We have Tufts Vets, which is a specialty practice in Walpole, and we have a really unique clinic called Tufts at Tech, which is a veterinary clinic housed in the Worcester Technical High School in Worcester, where they train the veterinary assistant uh, students in the high school. Uh, we train our veterinary students there and also provide low-cost care for uh, animals that otherwise would not be receiving veterinary care in the Worcester area. In addition to our hospitals, we also have a very large uh, research enterprise out there. So we do research, and then we train uh, the veterinary students. Uh, the veterinary school is four years. For those of you who are, who are not familiar with it, we have about 100 students in each of the classes. So it's gotten to be a pretty big campus out there and very, very active. Um, when I talk to people about what I do, 
And I'm a veterinary nutritionist. I did my training here, uh, but also did uh, residency and training in clinical nutrition. And um, just so you know, uh, Dr. Saltzman and I were fellows at the same time we shared an office, and I live to tell the tale from that. So um, what I do now is really a combination of things. And I tell everybody I, I can't imagine a better job because I get to do a combination of teaching of our veterinary students. Uh, I get to do research, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. I study nutrition and heart disease. And then um, I am in clinical practice. So those seven hospitals, we have the largest caseload of patients in any of the veterinary schools across the country. So it's a very busy clinic. And so I actually see patients as a board certified veterinary nutritionist. So um, just in, as in human medicine, you can have specialties, cardiology, ophthalmology, dermatology. We have those same specialties in veterinary medicine. And uh, for veterinary medicine, we have um, a nutritionist as one of those board certified specialties. So that's what I do. But to give you a little more of a picture of what I do on a daily basis, I thought I'd just show you some of my patients. Um, we have a very busy emergency and critical care service at the coming school. So lots of patients in our ICU at any one time. And just as in Tufts Medical Center, um, there are a lot of patients in the ICU that can't eat or won't eat and need nutritional support. So this was a puppy that fell in a swimming pool and drowned. He did live, don't worry, uh, but only because of the veterinary care that he received, including nutrition. Uh, we have animals that need feeding tubes. So uh, animals with chronic disease, eating tubes for long periods of time to maintain their lives and keep them going. Uh, mostly that's dogs and cats, uh, but sometimes turtles, um, rabbits, um, and even horses. We put feeding tubes sometimes. So all of those are, are my patients. Sometimes we have very small patients. So that's one of the challenges of veterinary medicine. Not only do my patients have very different anatomy, physiology, nutritional requirements, they come anywhere from about um, you know, less than a kilogram to a horse, which would be a couple of thousand pounds. So really wide size range. This was the smallest patient I've ever had to work with uh, that got intravenous nutrition while in the ICU. Mostly dogs and cats, but occasionally we get some unusual species. Uh, this was a giraffe that needed intravenous nutrition. And again, trying to come up with what's the right formula for a giraffe, a baby giraffe, uh, no, no less, and how are we going to provide that? How are we going to get a catheter into his vein in that neck? And how are we going to provide him with optimal nutrition? So that's one of the really interesting things about being a veterinarian is trying to come up with solutions for lots and lots of different species. We'll talk a little bit more about obesity. It's a very common problem in our patients. So we see patients that are overweight and obese. And then I see a lot of patients with chronic diseases. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what I do a day in the life of Lisa Freeman. Um, so what Chris didn't say is I actually have three Tufts degrees. So I have an undergraduate degree from the Medford campus, and then my veterinary degree and my PhD in nutrition from the Friedman School. And so I've spent a lot of time over the years on all three campuses. And what I've been able to see over that time is that there is not only expertise in nutrition on this campus at the Friedman School and the HNRCA, but there is a tremendous amount of nutrition strength across the entire university. And uh, I've also seen the benefits over these years of working together with people in a more interdisciplinary way. So when I've come to talk before at the Friedman School, what I've typically talked about is uh, my research, nutrition and heart disease. And what I've found in the last two times I've done this, I talk about all the really exciting things that I'm you know, interested in. And then at the end, someone always asks about their pet's diet. <laughs> so um, what I thought I would do today, instead of getting really researchy, is give you a little bit more of an overview of all the similarities that we have across the species in nutrition. And all the things that we're dealing with are so similar, um, no matter what species we're dealing with. So to talk about that, I thought it would help to put it into context of this One Health. Um, I'm very involved in this One Health program. Uh, the Tufts Clinical and Translational Science Institute is a very large program we have across the, the uh, university. And uh, it's pretty unique. There are only about 60-some uh, CTSIs across the country. 
uh, multi-million dollar NIH funding. Uh, and what is unique about Tufts is the complement schools that we have and the, the partners that we have as part of the program. Does that sound, is it cutting in and out? Yeah? All right. Well, if it doesn't work, I can just talk louder, too, and take this off. But we'll, we'll give that a try. Um, what's unusual about our CTSI is there are a lot of things that are unusual about it, but uh, we have uh, made One Health one of the signature programs of the CTSI, which is very unusual across all of those 60-some uh, CTSIs. And I'm the director of the CTSI One Health program, so I get uh, very active in this area. One Health is not new, though. This is um, Rudolf Virchow, who is a very famous physician. Uh, he's considered the father of pathology. And you can read his quote there. He worked with a lot of veterinarians and understood the benefits of working together and understood the similarities across a different species. So One Health is not a new concept at all. You all should know this guy. This is Jean Mayer. And um, he is actually my hero because when he, he was the 10th president of the university. And when he started, when he had his inaugural speech in 1976, he said he was going to start a veterinary school and he was going to start a school of nutrition. So that's why he's my hero, because I, those are both important to me. Uh, but even more so, what he said in his inaugural speech was that the veterinary school was going to be founded on the principles of one medicine. So basically, One Health. He talked about One Health. And because we have this complement of professional schools at the university, that was a, a real key to developing the veterinary school. So um, Chris talked about the, one of the definitions of One Health. And you can read that here. But I think the really key thing about One Health is that you know, people and animals and the environment are all linked. Yet they're usually studied in a siloed approach. People study just environment or just human nutrition or just animals. And you can't study them in isolation. They really have to be studied. Can I just take this off? Is that OK? Can you guys hear me if I talk like this? OK, let's just take that off. Um, so they can't be used in isolation. They can't be studied in isolation. We really need to study them together. And the way I think of One Health is that this is just an approach. Uh, an interdisciplinary approach to solving some of these challenging problems that affect humans, animals, and the environment. So um, when people think about, how many people have heard the concept of One Health before? OK, a fair number of people. If I asked you, if I took a poll, probably what most people would say is that it's about infectious disease. So zoonotic diseases are those that can go from animals to humans. And that's obviously a really important part of One Health. And if you look the CDC web, website, that's how they define One Health. But at Tufts, I think we have become a leader in One Health because we have a more global view of One Health. And we have four key areas that are included in this definition. And I'll just talk through those very briefly. So the first part is those zoonotic infectious diseases. So you know, there are viruses, parasites, bacteria, um, a variety of agents that can go either directly from animals to people or through a vector. So for example, um, West Nile virus is transmitted from animals through a mosquito to humans and potentially other animals. Um, there are tick-borne diseases and things like that. So these are all really, really important things and are affected by humans, by animals, and the environment. There are also issues of public health that are unrelated to infectious disease, but things like lead poisoning. So at the clinic I mentioned, Tufts at Tech, which is in the Worcester Technical High School, um, this is a, a low-cost clinic, and so if we have an animal that comes into that clinic that's identified to have lead poisoning, who else is likely to be affected by lead poisoning? The, the kids in the house. So that's a way that we can look at that. That's a sentinel for those kids being at risk for lead poisoning as well. And so we can report that to the state regulators and get those kids checked out. Ecosystem health is the next important part of One Health, and is certainly uh, very involved in, um, with humans and animals. I, I thought there was a great article in the Nutrition Magazine uh, that just came out a week ago. Um, so this was talking about Tufts Nutrition Top 10 in terms of how climate change will, in fact, ag will affect agriculture and nutrition. 
And so, you know, it lists the top 10 things, and all of these are obviously going to affect the environment, and they're going to affect human nutrition. But as a veterinarian, you know, the animals are really involved in there as well. So livestock will suffer. It's going to affect their production. It also affects their health and their welfare as well. So again, that's a really good example of how One Health, all of these things are tied together. The third part of One Health is human-animal interactions. Um, so there are many, many benefits of animals. How many people have a pet? Let me ask. Oh, gosh, we got a lot of pet people. OK, uh, good. So you're, you're part of my people here. This is perfect. Um, so we have a lot of animal-assisted therapy that goes on at the university. We have a large group called Tufts Paws for People uh, that is based out at the veterinary school but visits across the New England region. And we have identified many, many benefits of human-animal interactions and animal-assisted therapy. This just shows some examples um, of, of uh, animals helping kids learn to read, um, visiting with the elderly. We go to stress relief events on the Medford and Boston and Grafton campus um, during you know, finals time when everybody's a little stressed. Here's an educational opportunity where we're teach, teaching kids with heart disease about uh, the diseases and their treatment by having them uh, learn on the animals. So listen to animals that also had the same heart defects. So um, really a great educational opportunity as well. So many, many benefits have, are starting to be identified with animal-assisted therapy. Um, is Matt in the room? Where's Matt? This is for you. <laughs> I've discovered a corgi fan. <laughs> this is one of my dogs. Um, so there are lots and lots of benefits. And one of the things we've tried to do is not just have the feel-good part of animal-assisted therapy, but actually start to put evidence behind it. So we've done research looking at the benefits of kids learning to read with dogs, improving their reading skills and their attitudes toward reading. Uh, we've also done, reading, uh, we've done research on uh, therapy dogs visiting kids going through chemotherapy. And not just animal-assisted therapy, but also just pet ownership. For all of you who raise your hands that you have a pet, that animal is providing benefits to you. So we've uh, shown that uh, strong bonds with pets can help military-connected youth and can help with positive youth development. So they're not just our best friends, but they actually help us uh, mentally and physically as well. So I mentioned Tough Spaws for People. If you're interested in getting involved, uh, this is on our website here. Um, and you can learn about uh, how to, to participate, and uh, hopefully you can vis visit with some of our teams when they uh, come to Boston. The last part of One Health is natural animal models. And so there are a lot of similarities, uh, not just in looks, between our companion animals and ourselves. And in fact, we share a tremendous number of diseases uh, with our companion animals. This is just a, a short list of the diseases that we share with our companion animals. Um, and there are many, many more. So this is an issue that we can now study the animals to help people, but also to help the animals themselves. So uh, if we look at companion animals that naturally develop these diseases, it's going to be much more representative of the human disease than if we induce that disease in a rodent. The dog and cat genome have been sequenced, so we have that information now. Their reproductive time and lifetime, uh, lifespan is shorter than in humans, unfortunately. Uh, we can control a lot of confounding issues that occur when we study humans, but they live in the same environment, so they're exposed to all the same uh, factors that we would be. Their cost for a clinical trial in a dog or a cat is much, much lower than in a human, and there are a lot of breed predispositions that I'll talk about. So just, have any of you participated in a clinical trial? It's a, usually a great thing as a student. I have done that. It's a wonderful thing, a good money-making thing as a student. Um, but, you know, people can volunteer to participate in a clinical trial for themselves. But just the same way, people can volunteer to have their pets participate in these clinical trials. So we have about 50 clinical trials going on at the veterinary school right now uh, with cancer or heart disease or kidney disease where people can volunteer for their pets to participate. So this can serve as a stepping stone between rodent models and human clinical trials, but at the same time, we're studying ways that we can actually help these animals themselves. So I think these four key areas really provide uh, an opportunity for leadership in One Health at Tufts, 
but even more so is that we have a true leadership in one nutrition. There is nowhere on earth that has the same complement of nutrition expertise that Tufts has. And I would say that we don't always take advantage of that, either in teaching, in research, certainly. Um, we don't always take advantage of that when we talk to companies or foundations, and we don't use it to help enhance our communication. So I was thinking how I could present this today, and I got this, uh, this nice thing about the strategic plan a couple of weeks ago, um, and I'm sorry, you probably are all sick to death of seeing this, but here it is. Uh, but I thought this might be a good way of just presenting some of the different areas where there is really good uh, uh, overlap between uh, our campuses. And I really liked the mission statement too, because when I think about veterinary nutrition, this is exactly my goals in trying to, you know, impact science, leaders, and, um, you know, true impact. One of the areas that is obviously very important for human and veterinary medicine is reducing hunger. And in fact, the role of nutrition in veterinary medicine, uh, in, uh, role of veterinary medicine in nutrition has been in the area of farm animals and food production for many, many years. So when I went to veterinary school, I, my only nutrition course was learning about, you know, how do you feed cows to make more milk or make more meat? How do you feed chickens to make more eggs, um, cattle to make more milk? So it really was focused for many, many years on food production. And so there's a, a lot of interest still and importance there, both for the human and veterinary nutrition areas. But in addition to just making more product, we also want to make sure that it's sustainable for the environment and also that it will produce healthier products, so healthier meat, healthier milk, healthier eggs. And as a veterinarian, I want to make sure that those animals are staying healthier and that they're staying happier as well, so that their animal welfare is really addressed. And so this is where human nutrition and veterinary nutrition can really interact, um, as well as thinking about some of these agricultural and environmental issues at the same time, so that we improve um, all of these things at once. So there already has been work between uh, Friedman and Cummings School looking at sustainable agriculture and humane livestock systems. These are just a few examples that have been projects uh, that have been addressed over the years. So looking at organic versus conventional systems for production, not only for how much it makes, you know, how much meat or milk or eggs it makes, but also how it's going to impact the health and welfare of the animals that are involved. Um, looking at um, farm subsidies and how that affects environmental concerns. And the Cummings School has done kind of a cool thing in that they've actually come up with these um, production methods and marketing approaches for humanely raised veal, eggs, lamb, and pork. And so if you ever do come out to the veterinary school to visit, we actually sell eggs and this humanely raised uh, meat on campus as well. And so this goes by the Azaluna uh, brand. So we certainly want to reduce hunger. That's obviously a very important thing um, across our campuses. But the other thing that is a common goal is reducing the burden of obesity. So this is one of my patients that is obviously very obese. Um, unfortunately, obesity is incredibly common in, our, in my patients now. So it's the most common nutritional disorder that we see. Uh, the, Prevalence rates have been estimated anywhere from 25 to 70 percent. I will say the 25 percent is about 20 years old. The newer numbers are 50, probably 50 to 70 percent. It mostly, well, it occurs in dogs and cats. You can see a couple examples here of um, obese dogs and cats, but it's really just in about every species that we keep as pets. So uh, another cat, uh, pigs, horses, guinea pigs, Anything that we have domesticated to be our pets, we have made overweight. So we're not doing a very good job with ourselves or with our animals. Uh, there are health risks, just as there are in people. So obesity increases the risk for diabetes, arthritis, back disease. This little dachshund had just had surgery for a slip disc because of his obesity and shorter lifespan. Uh, one interesting note is it is, does not increase the risk for coronary artery disease in dogs and cats, and that can be used as an advantage.
advantage because we can actually uh, remove that confounding effect of coronary disease when we're studying obesity in dogs and cats. Now there are some predisposed breeds. Um, the Labrador is kind of the poster child for obesity and it was recently discovered that they actually have a gene mutation in the pro opio um mm -hmm. gene that uh, predisposes them to being highly motivated to eat and um, to being overweight. Does anybody have a Labrador? Yeah, right, they love to eat. <laughs> um, but other breeds as well, uh, both in cats and dogs. So there's a higher, higher risk, but just about every breed is, uh, can become overweight and obese. So genetics can play a role. Um, and endocrine disorders, most owners tell me, I'm sure it's his thyroid doc, um, and it usually is not, but it can occur. Most commonly, it is the same things as in people. It's excessive calories, and that can be from the commercial pet foods. Um, because of the competition in the industry, companies have had to make their pet foods very, very palatable. And as a result, the animals really like them and keep eating them. Some are very high calorie, and so they often are eating a lot of excess calories. Also, many, many treats and snacks. Then there is also a lack of exercise. So just as we are becoming couch potatoes, so too are our pets. Um, body image, not this little terrier's image of herself, but of our image. So I try to keep my dogs nice and trim, obviously. And I actually have people on the street to say to me, what's wrong with your dog? He's so skinny. So people don't even um, realize what dogs and cats are supposed to look like anymore. And then not necessarily an issue in people, but uh, there's a high rate of neutering in the United States, which is very beneficial for dogs and cats' health, but um, it does reduce their calorie requirements. And so if people don't compensate for that, that increases their risk of obesity. Dogs and cats that are obese have the, all the same physiologic changes that people do. And when we get them to lose weight, those changes reverse. So this can be a really good model for human obesity. Now the treatment is challenging, just as, as it is in people. There are uh, veterinarians that are proposing using surgery, some of the bariatric techniques that are used in people. There was a drug available on the market uh, that was used uh, for overweight dogs. But mostly it is, you know, kind of the boring things, increase exercise and reduce calorie intake. One of the challenges is that pet foods range quite a bit in calories, anywhere from 200 to over 600 calories a cup. Um, and uh, even the weight management foods, you can see the range there, a pretty wide range in calories. And here's just some examples of some of the foods, prescription diets um, up here, over-the-counter diets, and there's even a light uh, chicken soup for the cat lover's soul. Thank goodness we have that. So this actually brings up a policy issue because until a few years ago, calories were not required on pet food labels. And this is something I got involved with through uh, my specialty college, American College of Veterinary Nutrition. It took us seven years, but we finally got it required that calories are now required on pet food labels. So hopefully that will be some assistance. It's not just the food, it is the treats. Pet treats are the fastest growing segment of the pet food industry. And you can see just some examples here. Um, dog yogurt, 50 calorie packs of pepperonis, for those weight conscious uh, pets. Uh, we have whole bakeries that sell treats for dogs and cats. Uh, the, some of these jumbones, they are over a thousand calories a treat. So huge numbers of calories. This is a great one. I'll talk a little bit about uh, byproducts later, but um, chicken heart bites. So here's a great, when you talk about entrepreneurship, here's someone who took the byproducts of the human, pet, of the human food industry these hearts that almost nobody eats, and they dry them out and they sell them for a lot of money. So really smart. But all of those will add calories. So we have a lot of images and a lot of uh, challenges to successful weight loss in our dogs and cats, just like we do in people. Um, the calories, but things like body image, readiness to change, uh, various people in the household, various pets in the household can make it really difficult, a lack of exercise, and certainly, um, food is love. You know, they give you those big brown eyes, it's really hard to turn them down sometimes. So, a lot of the same challenges with our patients, um, but hopefully this provides us lots of opportunities as well. 
Uh, so we have actually developed an obesity clinic for animals at the veterinary school. Dr. Linder runs that and um, sees patients that come in specifically for being overweight or obese. We also are able to study this in different populations. So we've studied this in general practices and also in this low cost clinic that we have in Worcester. And what was interesting is that the prevalence of obesity was not different. So whether you're at the low cost clinic um, or at the regular clinic, um, over 50%. And their reasons for diet selection were identical. So cost was actually one of the lowest reasons that they selected their diet. So that was not really an important factor. It was that it was healthy for the pet, the ingredients were good, and that the pet liked it. So dogs and cats can be modeled for human obesity, the same prevalence, physiology, and behavior. Um, I like to look at people as animal models for my patients. So uh, we can find ways to better treat dogs and cats that are overweight. And then finally, people and animals can work together. One way would be increasing exercise. People with dogs walk more. Uh, to get around that for people who don't have dogs, we actually just started a walking program at the coming school. So this is a program I started with my, this is one of my other dogs. This is a therapy dog. And um, we lead a walk every Friday on the Grafton campus so that people will get out, you know, get out of their desks and their offices and come out and walk every Friday. So we've had a really great uh, response to that. So encouraging people to walk and exercise is one way, but there's actually another way as well. Um, this was a study that Dr. Linder did looking at uh, kids that were overweight or obese compared to healthy weight children. And the kids that were overweight and obese had greater attachment to their, their pets than the healthy weight children and less perceived social support from their parents and friends. So the dogs actually seem to be part of their social support network. And that may be something we can take advantage of both in motivation and to, uh, for adherence to programs. So I mentioned um, policy is one area. I talked about the calories on labels is, is one thing that we've tried to push and got that implemented. I also was on a committee uh, through the World Small Animal Veterinary Association to get nutritional assessment guidelines. And for many, many years, uh, the vital assessments that you're supposed to do on a patient would be temperature, pulse, respiration, and pain. And so our goal is to get the fifth vital assessment to be nutrition, so that every patient at every visit, you do a nutritional assessment. Um, and these guidelines that we put together are now available in 11 languages and have been adopted by 29 different countries. So hopefully, we can uh, be a little ahead of the curve from human medicine in this area in getting nutrition really incorporated into medicine. Um, Dr. Linder has also been involved in weight management guidelines. So uh, one of the issues with veterinary nutrition is that there are only about 100 board certified veterinary nutritionists in the US. So there are not a lot of us. And um, we're very fortunate at the coming school because if you look across all the schools in the United States, the veterinary schools, there are about 30, and only about a third of those have a veterinary nutritionist. And we are fortunate to not have just one, but we have three. So we've been very involved in a lot of these efforts trying to um, you know, advance the policy about veterinary nutrition as well. So I want to talk just a little bit about catalyzing interdisciplinary collaboration and translational science. Um, I mentioned these diseases that are very common in dogs and cats. And what I'd like to just talk briefly about is my favorite two, which is um, heart disease and cachexia. So heart disease is very, very common in dogs and cats. They can be born with heart diseases, all the same uh, heart diseases that people can get, and then they can acquire heart disease. Uh, so diseases of the mitral valve or, or of the heart muscle. So this is common in dogs and cats. So uh, one interesting note is that coronary artery disease is very rare in dogs and cats. So that's not something we study in dogs and cats, but all of these other diseases are ones that occur in people. For all those people who raise your hand that you have a pet, if you have a dog or a cat, 10 to 15% of all dogs and cats have heart disease. So it's one of the most common diseases that they get. And um, if you have this cat, anybody know what breed this is? Maine Coon cat, good. So about a third of them develop heart disease. What breed is this? Doberman Pinscher. 50% of them have heart disease. Dilated cardiomyopathy. Sorry if anybody has a Doberman. Um, and how about, what is this breed? Cavalier, world's cutest dog. 
um, 100% have heart disease. So if you have a Cavalier or want a Cavalier, get to know a veterinary cardiologist. So it's a very common problem. Um, and I'll just show you a really brief video uh, illustrating a collaboration that we've had with Tufts Medical Center studying cats with heart disease. People and companion animals share many of the same diseases. And by studying them in an interdisciplinary way, we can be much more effective in solving these medical problems that affect both human patients and my patients. One of the challenges in both cats and people is a heart disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In humans, it's present in about one in 500 to one in 5,000 people. It's much more common in cats where the estimates are around 10% of cats will have this condition. Many of the same tools are used in both humans and cats, including ultrasound of the heart, something called an echocardiogram. There aren't all that many examples of um, human disease being present almost in exactly the same form as in animals. And so for that reason, you know, it really serves as a great model uh, for us to, to learn from. Many of the basic treatments are the same in both uh, cats and humans. Sadly, there is, does not exist currently any specific medication that prevents or significantly alters the treatment of this condition. Both people and cats who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can have a genetic mutation, a gene that develops an abnormal protein in the heart muscle. We see those obvious parallels between the two which have strengthened our understanding of the disease and made it clear that potentially by studying cats we may further inform our knowledge of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in humans and vice versa. We believe that there is an important role for nutrition in the development and progression of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we've studied this in cats and found that cats that are larger and grow more quickly are more likely to develop this disease. If we can learn about a nutritional link that affects the development or severity of the disease, then that information may be helpful in trying to manage or treat people that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well. The principle that we could advance our understanding of a disease by you know, learning from both humans and animal models with, with the disease makes tremendous sense to everybody who hears it. This work is really exciting because it offers the opportunity to work with colleagues in many different disciplines to solve these very challenging problems that affect people and companion animals. As a rule, the greater the opportunity to collaborate, the greater the opportunity to make meaningful, impactful discoveries. So hopefully that provides a good example of the ways that physicians and veterinarians can work together to study this problem that we share in our patients. And um, in, in doing that, we can actually help all of our patients. Um, the other thing uh, I'll just really briefly mention is cachexia, because this is a real passion of mine. Uh, this is, as you probably know, a loss of muscle mass that occurs in collaboration with uh, heart disease, uh, cancer, kidney disease, and a variety of others. It's related to sarcopenia, which is the aging-associated muscle loss that was coined by Irv Rosenberg from here. Um, and it has really important clinical implications affecting strength, immune function, wound healing, and mortality. And you can see on this dog that had heart failure, he's, uh, he's a little bit thin. You can kind of see his ribs, but more importantly, he's lost tremendous amounts of muscle over his shoulder, over his back, over his head. Um, when I was working in the HNRCA during my PhD, it was what was called at that point the body composition lab, and I was studying rheumatoid cachexia in rodents which I didn't really enjoy that much, and the, the research didn't work out that well. So if any of you have uh, had an experiment that was not successful the first time, don't get discouraged. You can still uh, get through it. Uh, at the same time, what was very fortuitous is that I was also seeing patients at the veterinary school, and I saw a dog named Dougie who had heart failure and cardiac cachexia. So he had a lot of muscle, and because I was studying the, the rodents with rheumatoid arthritis, I found that uh, fish oil was one thing that was being used to help treat cachexia. 
And so I put Dougie on fish oil and it was really miraculous. He had a tremendous response. Um, the, this dog is actually not Dougie, but this was Dougie after the fish oil. <laughs> but he was, he was that thin. That's what he, he truly looked like this. Um, he was, um, had so much muscle loss and he actually got overweight um, after a period of time. So this prompted a study and much to my mentor's chagrin, I ended up doing my PhD thesis looking at fish oil supplementation in dogs with heart failure and uh, cardiac cachexia. So, um, you know, working across the species again was very fruitful. So lots of potential interventions with cachexia. Um, I'll just skip over these for now, but uh, this is a way that we can actually study some of these potential interventions in the dog model. You know, my patients, uh, these owners can volunteer their dogs to participate in a clinical trial like this one where we were testing a myostatin inhibitor. Uh, this is a dog, it's a little hard to see with this light, but a lot of muscle loss over his back, over his head. And after four weeks of this myostatin inhibitor, this is that same dog and had not only gained fat too, which we didn't want, um, but had gained quite a lot of muscle over his head, his back, etc. So a nice stepping stone between rodent, clinical, rodent research and human clinical trials. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, another passion of mine, and I think a really important area in veterinary nutrition as well as in human nutrition now, and that's uh, we need a trusted voice in nutrition. And I think Tufts really has the, um, the credibility to be that trusted voice. Uh, as I mentioned, there are only about 100 board certified veterinary nutritionists. These are the three that we have at Cummings. And so, you know, we see a lot of patients at the school uh, that come in for various nutritional problems. Um, part, so we've developed this website and part of it is our services so uh, veterinarians can refer their patients to us, so owners can set up appointments and things like that. But uh, the major focus of this website is actually one that is directed at pet owners. And we call it Pet Foodology. Um, so you can check this out. It's petfoodology.org. And we have, have tried to develop information for owners uh, to help them understand the truth about pet nutrition because there is so much misinformation. If you look at all of the human food fads, these are just some of them, they are all in pet nutrition as well, every single one of them. It is amazing. And when I first started out, as a veterinarian, the food fads that went from humans into pets, there would be like a five or 10 year lag. It's like a year now or less. It is amazing. Things become popular in human nutrition, these fad diets, and almost immediately they're in pet nutrition. So I thought I would just let you walk through, um, you know, a day in my shoes in dealing with pet nutrition and see what is out there now. So here are just a few examples. This is one, Blue Buffalo is, um, they are one of, unfortunately one of the big perpetuators of a lot of the myths. Here's a high protein, low carb diet for the, you know, the wild cat in your house cat. Um, grain free cat food. Um, here's another one, fussy cat, grain free cat food. There is pumpkin from Nummy Tum Tum for your pets with, a, thank goodness, a BEPA-free liner. This is pumpkin. It is just canned pumpkin with this label that is marketed to pet for like four times the cost. But it gets worse. There is um, pumpkin spice flavor dental treats. <laughs> Limited edition, so I don't think you can get them anymore. Sorry. Uh, and this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is gluten-free. It's made with chicken, organic quinoa, vegetables, and love. Thank goodness. <laughs> Here's another one I found. So this is um, cage-free turkey formula, grain, gluten, and potato-free. Um, and here we've got our coconut, kale, and berries because that is certainly what cats eat out in the wild. What's interesting, you know, it gets to the marketing. Uh, when we have done a lot of surveys, owners have said the main thing they look at when they're buying a pet food is the ingredient list. The ingredient list is absolutely worthless to look at. And one of the things is this is marketing down here. If these nutrients or these ingredients are way down at the bottom, I call it fairy dust. There is not enough in there to do anything other than to be able to put it on the label. But that's how they can say we've got blueberries and cranberries and coconut in our food. Um, there's the BFF brand for your BFF cat. 
Uh, this is one of my favorites, Party Animal Brand. And here's the Tomcat Turkey. And look at all the things. I want you to notice what it doesn't include. A lot of the companies are marketing to what is not in the food. We avoid X, Y, and Z. Here's our no list. Um, this one has no junk or weird stuff. No, I can't even read that. No soy and wheat, no artificial colors, etc. Even better from Party Animal is the Duck Duck product. Yes, it's true. So again, you know, they have this no list of what it doesn't have in there. So really uh, playing on people's fears about uh, pet nutrition. This one I just identified. Um, I was at Stop and Shop a week ago, and I heard on the overhead announcement talking about this gentle giant's food. So I had to immediately walk over to the pet food aisle. So this is made by the guy, Bert, um, I don't know what his name is, Bert, oh, Bert Ward, who played Robin on Batman and Robin, because clearly that qualifies him to um, make pet food. And it lives, um, his dogs are living as long as 27 years because of this food. Look what it's not in there. No GMOs, you know, it's got all this other stuff in there. Here's, here's one of the labels. It's, it's crazy. It's just amazing. Um, Grain-free, poultry-free. Uh, here's the ingredient list, I won't, but just all sorts of stuff in there, marketing to us. Um, and a lot of misinformation, how this is heart healthy. Remember I told you how dogs don't get coronary artery disease? Well, thank goodness we have a low-fat diet for them now. That's really great. So lots of interesting stuff. Now, we may laugh about this, but it actually has serious consequences because where we are typically eating a pretty varied diet, dogs and cats typically eat a single diet. So if those companies don't know what they're doing and may, they make a bad, deficient, or imbalanced diet, that can really harm animals. Here's a food um, from Iceland. Yay. Uh, and it's supposed to be complete and balanced nutritionally. Based on the list, it's got liver, lamb, et cetera, and a little calcium. That's it. It can't be complete and balanced. So I actually analyzed this, and it was deficient in about 12 different nutrients. Yet people are feeding that to their cat thinking it's a complete and balanced diet. People are feeding home-cooked diets, sometimes uh, you know, from recipes all over the place. And we've done analyses. 99.9% .9 of them are nutritionally unbalanced, unless they have a board-certified nutritionist formulated. So people are trying to do the best for their pets and potentially harming them. There are companies now that make homemade diets and will ship it to you. There are even uh, blue apron type companies who will ship you the ingredients to your pet food so you can make it at home. It is amazing what is out there. Um, and you know, really interesting marketing, uh, tummy friendly and gentle and detoxifying and um, a miracle food. Raw meat diets are another one. Um, the people make them at home, but also this is just a list that I put together a couple months ago of the companies that make raw meat diets now, commercially. These are all available, readily available. Uh, no health benefits have ever, ever been proven, yet we have reams of evidence of nutritional imbalances, health risks for the pet, um, infections, hyperthyroidism, et cetera, and health risks for the people. So the rates of salmonella contamination, of these are commercial diets that you buy in the store. People are buying these with up to a 48% risk of salmonella, up to 54% risk of listeria, clostridium, et cetera. There was one just recalled, one of these uh, Blue Apron kind of companies, uh, they were just recalled for listeria last week. Not only are the diets contaminated, the animals shed it in their stool. So if you have a pet in the household and it's eating a raw diet, you're being exposed to all of those nasty things as well. So it's really an interesting time, and I would, if you do feed a raw diet, don't do this. <laughs> um, so I think this really gets to uh, one of the big similarities across the, the fields, and that's of the importance of nutrition communication, behavior change, and you know, Chris and I have known each other a long time, talked to work with Sean and Jean on these things. And there's a lot of opportunity for sharing information and working together on these. We have a lot of the same challenges of you know, mixed messages and dealing with Dr. Google, um, people concerned about things being natural and um, you know, people thinking, well, it's nutrition. We all eat. I know about nutrition. So they think they, they know how to make their pets food, for example, how uh, you know, Robin can formulate a diet and it must be healthy. 
And there's a lot of pressure because the pet food industry is about a $26 billion a year industry. So it is a tremendously competitive market. And there are companies you know, where they're perpetuating myths saying you know, our food doesn't have all these things, whereas all these other companies do. So it's very challenging. And you know, here's a Dr. Google thing, how roadkill ends up in Fido's food bowl, what byproducts are, et cetera. Uh, we did a study when uh, about 852 dog owners and we asked them what they avoid when they choose their pet food and this is the list look how many avoid things and this was about five years ago so it's probably even worse now byproducts are one of the things that people really worry about this is the actual definition of meat byproducts so it's basically the organs of the animal um, and that sustain you know we get back to sustainability if people if animals ate um, muscle meat, they would compete with the human food chain. We'd actually have to kill a lot more animals to feed our pets and our people if they were competing for that same meat. So the pet food industry typically does use the byproducts. There are good and bad quality byproducts, just like there's good and bad you know, quality meat, um, yet there's a lot of myth about byproducts. We did in a separate survey of about 1,200 people, we asked what are byproducts, and 87% correctly said internal organs, um, but look at the, what, how much people thought these other things are in here. Things that are specifically prohibited from being in pet food, in byproducts. So there's a lot of confusion and this is really perpetuated by companies too. And people actually pay for this. Here's lungs, so that's a byproduct. Someone, um, again, entrepreneurial, they've taken lungs, they dry them out, and they sell this literally for $20 a bag. Chicken hearts, again, um, and that myrrh diet, um, beef lungs, beef liver, lamb lungs, etc. That's byproducts. Here, they pay a lot of money for it. If it's labeled as byproducts, they're afraid of it. And I'll just uh, leave you with uh, one last thing. This is a study that uh, I did with Sean Cash looking at why people have their purchase, what their purchasing decisions are when they're buying pet food. So this was a really interesting collaboration. And just what I thought was most interesting about this is we asked people, just one of the many questions, how important is it to buy healthy food for yourself? Okay, so here, here are the answers. So people thought it was pretty important. This was about uh, 2,000 people. We also asked those same people, how important is buying healthy food for your pet? They care more about the health of their pet than themselves. So people are really, really passionate about their pet's nutrition. So it provides us a lot of opportunities, but definitely challenges because there is so much misinformation out there. So that's one of the reasons we have Pet Foodology, trying to get correct information out there and you know, cut through all the myth. Uh, so we have information on, you know, can joint diets help my dog's pain? muscle condition scoring in dogs, um, digestive enzyme supplements, byproducts, grains, etc. So you can check that out. So um, hopefully this rapid uh, um, view of the different areas of One Nutrition at Tufts gave you a little more of a picture of what goes on at Tufts. Certainly the Friedman School is the center of our nutrition universe at Tufts, but I think we have a tremendous number of assets across the three campuses that we can really take advantage of uh, for advancing nutrition for all species and the environment. So I'll end there. Here's my information if you'd like to contact me, but I think we have a few minutes for questions if anybody uh, has any. Yes. So here's one of the occupational hazards of being a veterinarian. I, I have rejects um, from hospitals. So all of my animals have medical conditions, so they have to be on very special diets. Um, but I think my main recommendation for anyone, whether you, know, you have a sick pet or healthy pet, is feeding a food made by a well-known, reputable company that has, um, has really accurate, very strong nutritional knowledge and that expertise, not Robin but actual nutritionists, um, and that they have incredibly rigorous quality control. There are companies that have really great quality control, not making it with love, but really true quality control, and there are companies that are a lot laxer. And so, you know, it's a pretty big spectrum out there, so, you know, looking on, there's information on the label of 
uh, whether the food's even complete and balanced, who's made it, and um, finding out information about that company. And we have on uh, pet food allergy, we have um, the questions you should be asking. So you may want to check out that blog to see the questions. Rather than looking at the ingredient list, what questions you really should be asking about a pet food. Chris. Thank you, that's great. Um, and as Chris brought, it's your job to tell us this amazing place. So thank you, you're doing a good job. So the question was about sponsorship by pet food companies. So, you know, I, I know a lot of you apply for NIH funding and, you know, various other funding, federal funding, which is really, really challenging right now. Veterinary medicine is even worse because we can't apply to NIH. Unless I can convince NIH that my dog model or my cat model of heart disease is a model for humans, they couldn't care less about my patients. And so we really can't, we, we have a lot fewer agencies to apply to, so it's mostly foundations and industry. And so we do have to be really careful about that. We definitely do take industry support, um, but think about whether it's support, like directly testing a product versus, you know, studying uh, heart disease in dogs more generally. Um, so we try to lean more towards the latter. And then we also are uh, very careful to have quite strong uh, contracts so that, you know, data is always be published no matter what, whether it's positive or negative. So we have those kind of safeguards in there. But it's something we deal with all the time and owners, pet owners are very suspicious of us. And so, you know, we try to have that information available for them. So just to add and to, to give you guys the paper more quickly, pet us folks asking us about the wine. Oh, so nice. Pat, I'll send your data. Perfect. <laughs> That's great.
you have to tell, you have to send me 